Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos, and I'm thrilled to be back making a podcast episode. I know it's been a while, um, but if you're listening to this and you're unaware, you may want to go to qualitypolicing.com because uh, in the past few months, I was working on putting together what I'm calling the Violence Reduction Project. And it is in, it, it is in response to the increase uh, in murders last year in America, the largest increase in American history by far. Um, and I asked uh, 30 people um, for their answers, for their solutions as to what we can do to bring down violence now. Um, and it is a collection of um, about 30 essays directly related to violence reduction. So do feel free to check that out. Again, it is at uh, qualitypolicing.com. Uh, I am here today, uh, and I'm very thrilled to be here today with Justin Fenton. Um, Justin is a crime reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and he was part of the Pulitzer Prize finalist staff recognized for their coverage of the Baltimore riots that followed the death of Freddie Gray. And he has recently published his first book. Um, it is called We Own This City, a true story of crime, cops, and corruption in an, an American city. It is published by Random House, and in this case, the American city is Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and I picked up the book a week ago, which is just out, and um, I read it pretty much nonstop. It is a page turner. And um, two and a half days later, I, I put it down and said, damn, that was a good book. Uh, and I'm not just saying that. Um, and you've also done good reporting for the Baltimore Sun. And I'm not just saying that because I think you know that I can be very critical of journalists when appropriate, uh, but I've tended to be pretty supportive of your work because you do good work and, and you follow in the footsteps of some fabulous journalists. You follow in the footsteps of Peter Herman, who's now uh, with the Washington Post. And he was mentored presumably a bit under um, David Simon of Wire fame. And I presume that David Simon himself was uh, mentored personally by H.L. Mencken. But I'm not quite certain about that. Um, but um, it is interesting that the Baltimore Sun has such a storied history on particularly the crime and police beat. Um, and you've also, and, and you've been there for, when did you start there? You've been there for a long time. Yeah, I've been there since 2005. Um, is there anything particular about the sun or wh why do the crime reporters last so long? Is, uh, usually there's a lot more turnover. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I, I still feel like I'm learning every day. I mean, the way, the, you know, um, the issues, um, you know, um, the perspective on things is something that I feel like I'm, uh, uh, you know, the landscape is always changing. The, you know, we have a lot of turnover with our police chiefs and, and administration, but you know, um, I still feel like I'm, I'm starting to, you know, hit my stride with being able to tell better stories because of knowing more people and having more context and having better understanding of things. So when, so you've been at this for well over a decade. Um, when did you first get the hint of the corruption that, that, that later became We Own the City? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, the way misconduct was often presented was that it was bad apples, you know, and that was easy to go with because um, it was always isolated incidents in, in terms of like an individual officer being charged with, you know, improperly accessing a database and feeding information to a drug dealer and individual officer dealing drugs from the police station parking lot uh, and working with drug dealers there, you know, a, a, an officer who failed an integrity thing, you know, so you always had like, and then like the King and Murray case in the mid uh, mid aughts, you know, that was two officers working in tandem. So, you know, while there were certainly lots of uh, allegations of misconduct, the idea that it could be like orchestrated and carried out by an entire squad or that, you know, like it, it was e it was easy for officials to characterize it as as bad apples. And so this case kind of, you know, ripped off the covers in a way that exposed that, you know, officers who were so inclined to do this stuff were able to uh, operate in this fashion you know, for a prolonged period of time and in concert with each other. Um, so, yeah, it was years of sort of seeing it emerge piecemeal. And then, you know, the indictment here and the wiretaps 
and then the officers cooperating with the feds, it just it offered a, a brand new insight into it in a way that in the past was maybe only whispered about or allegations that couldn't be uh, supported. Now, so I worked as a Baltimore City police officer from late 99 to mid uh, 2001 and wrote a book called Cop in the Hood about uh, policing in Baltimore in the Eastern District. In that book, and I'm paraphrasing myself, I wrote something um, like undoubtedly they're corrupt officers because they get caught. Um, but the culture of policing uh, in Baltimore is basically clean. Um, hasn't aged well 20 years later, that line. Um, do you think the police department changed or was I just clueless to what was going on around me? I mean, that's tough because, I, again, in the, in the course of researching the book, you know, sort of reconnecting with contacts I've had over the years or, or meeting new people and trying to get them to explain to me, OK, let you know, now that it's out there, let, let's talk about it. I, I grant people anonymity. I would say, listen, I, you got nothing to lose here. It's just you and me over a beer. Let's let, let's let, let's get real. And like everybody would say, no, honestly, we don't know about this stuff. And, and they have there's selfish reasons for people to say that for sure. I mean, even if I granted someone anonymity, they're not going to be keen on admitting to witnessing crimes or taking part in crimes. But people would say we, we don't know what this is about. This is not something that we saw go on. You know, conversely, the officers got in trouble. <laughs> say everybody's doing it. You know, D Detective Gondo says everybody did this. Maurice Ward said you had to do it to fit in, you know, so it's like, you know, I wonder if both can be true. I wonder if in certain circles or certain units or certain type of work, it was commonplace and it was, I would, I would guess more casual, you know, um, skimming some money, not these big heists that ended up, you know, being uh, part of what, what Jenkins was uh, you know, charged with and pleaded guilty to, but, you know, skimming money, cutting corners. Um, I think that stuff did become commonplace. Um, it was easy to lie about um, before body cameras, especially. Um, but that doesn't mean that the officers that you saw out there in patrol and other unit or came in contact with from other units weren't weren't doing things right. I, I think it's it's kind of, one of the things I try to portray in the book is that it's complicated. I think that after the trial, everybody did come away with the idea of everybody's doing this, uh, you know, you know, lock up the whole police department. And it's like as you get into some of the characters and stories, you know, there's people who can credibly say. I didn't know that was going on. Yeah, I can, I, I do. I mean, I don't think this was going on when I was there. I mean, I'm pretty sure it wasn't, it hasn't been caught. My, partly it is hard to retire as a dirty cop because it's a great get out of jail free card for, for criminals. Um, that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is I still say the culture in general um, doesn't support that. Uh, but I will to sort of add on to what you said, if there, it's very easy to, turn a willful eye away from what you think where there's smoke um, because in the police department there is guilt by association um, there is distrust of the discipline process being um, arbitrary and somewhat random as to who it chooses to punish yeah and the idea is if they want to get you for they can um, because all cops violate some rules all of the time and that's not rules are not laws i mean i'm talking about petty departmental stuff but if they want to get you they can um, but certainly uh you know, I saw drug squad, squad uh, raid houses, and I didn't like the way they operated. Um, not that I saw them do anything criminal or dirty, but I just thought they were unnecessarily, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, they didn't have to cut open that couch. Uh, yeah, there might have been drugs in there, but come on. You, that wasn't why you cut open that couch kind of thing. Um, so people tend, you know, I talk to officers. No, we, do, we don't want to be part of that mentality, that mindset, uh, which is not to say it was a criminal mindset, but you just turn your turn away from it. Um, well, I, I like the one thing you, you blogged about something you refer to as the blue cone of silence. And that always resonated with me. This idea that you see stuff, you know, you're not sure about it, or maybe you are sure about it, but you're not sure it's going to be handled correctly. And you just sort of move away from it. And you're just like, that's somebody else's problem. I don't, I don't want to get caught up in this stuff. I don't um, want to be on the scene when someone files a complaint against that officer. And I don't know yeah. if they're going to file it, but I don't want to be there uh, because I, I've got to cover my own ass. I think I call it the blue wall of ignorance um, as opposed to silence because cops do rat out cops often, but, but you put on blinders. Um, so, you, so you can give, so first of all, so you honestly don't know, uh, that's on, that's the incentive. Um, and at a next level, at least so you have plausible deniability. Um, but yeah, what's going to happen if three months later you say, well, you know, what happened there at the, you know, the corner of, of 
of Wolf and Eager and, you know, three months ago. And you're like, I don't even remember. I'm like, well, here on the run sheet, it says you were there. And you're like, I, well, I guess I was I yeah. a lot of places. Um, there's, so there's, there's, there's a character in the book, Ryan Gwen, who he believes that the detective Gondo is, is dirty, but he doesn't have proof. He, he sees him, you know, uh, having dinner with someone who Gwen is investigated, who's a drug dealer in the community. And he, he doesn't, he just doesn't feel right. And he sees him interact with people on, on another occasion. And he reports it to the FBI and to the deputy commissioner and nothing happens. And then he's freaked out that like, it's going to get back to him. And like, he, he didn't have the goods, but he went ahead and, and, and said something anyway. And he just like, he sort of regretted it almost. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's that hard. that kind of thing is a real it's it's difficult. To com- to- it's hard to complain and say my spidey sense is tingling. And that's often what it is. Yeah. Um, the NYPD has a, anonymous phone line cops can call by the way and and give tips on other cops and cops use it um as far as i know baltimore does not have that so um that perhaps is one way to start but you also have to have faith in the internal affairs division and believe that they're on the state on on the level um when i was there soon after before i forget the timeline there was the fbi uh, staples uh investigation and um that crashed and burned in part because uh files were stolen from the internal affairs secret <laughs> office right. ironically recovered in a dunkin donuts uh dumpster um then after i left there was the tow truck scandal yeah um, and that was the first it was as scandals go it was minor in terms of i don't think anyone was hurt it was corruption right uh, but i remember talking to you know, a friend of mine who was still on the job, and and I and he had called me and said, D- "Can you, can you fathom this?" And I, I said, "No." I mean, that that was the idea that I could not imagine that happening. Um, now it didn't help that Baltimore City Police went to Puerto Rico to recruit police officers and recruited from one of the most corrupt departments in America because they were later busted by the FBI, and some of those dirty cops came to Baltimore and some of them were part of that scandal. But that that was like oh that was kickback money. That was old fashioned '60s corruption. And that yeah, was exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was yeah, Holland, what's his name in the stop snitching uh, video. But again, they got outed, they got arrested, and they also said everyone's doing it. And everyone else said, no, actually, we're not doing it. And you're criminal. Um, and then in this, so I maybe because um, I'm assuming most people listening uh, have not read your book, though they should. It is We Own This City by Justin Fenton, F-E-N-T-O-N. It is uh, eminently readable. It's downright enjoyable. Um, but maybe if you just give a I know it's hard to do it quick, to hard to give a short summary, but what happened? No, yeah, I've been, I've, I've been doing this a few times. So <laughs> no, so th- there's basically a story about a corrupt unit of officers, plainclothes officers. Uh, for those who don't know, that's different from undercover officers. These are not people assuming different identities and infiltrating organizations. These are officers who worked in plain clothes, unmarked cars, and were doing the proactive policing that the agency has relied on for so long uh, and continues in many ways. And they were abusing that power. They were stealing money from people. They were uh, doing searches without probable cause. Um, they were, you know, lying on official documents. In some cases, uh, in some of the officers were stealing drugs and uh, having them resold on the streets. Um, this was going on for some time. This unit was sort of brought together, though, post uh, Freddie Gray, uh, during the time when the Department of Justice was you know, supposedly looking under every rock and behind every corner looking for stuff like this, and they did not find it. Um, and so it, I sort of trace the rise of Wayne Jenkins, the sergeant and leader of the group and the officer who, who was found to have been doing the most. Um, and he was viewed within the police department as one of its best. They relied on him to get guns. They thought he was doing a great job. And I track his career with the shifting police strategies, the scandals that arose and were, you know, brushed off and, and sort of how, how can all this happen? Um, and so it also gets into the death of, uh, of Detective Sean Souter, who was um, uh, fatally shot. And it's, there's a lot of debate about what happened there. And so I try to, I try to cover all that at in a, about 300 pages so <laughs> there's a lot a, a, a lot of material now, i noticed and maybe it was my imagination um i thought i felt very much the tone of the book change at the end when he shifted the sean Souter's sean Souter's death and the investigation um certainly as you know because you reported on it is uh it's a touchy subject and a lot of people have strong opinions i mean the basic thing is uh was it suicide or murder i mean that that's 
the short version of the issue. Um, did you feel any sort of special duty or obligation on, on how you covered that as compared to the rest of the book? Um, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's it, it, everything you just said. It's a, it's a very sensitive topic. It's somebody's death and, and I don't want to uh, be frivolous with that. I mean, you know, when that, when that happened and the connections started to be raised that he was about to testify before the grand jury investigating Jenkins and a drug planting incident from 2010, you know, there was a strong reaction in the community that this must have been a murder, that there must have been people in on it. And, and, and actually the shift in the story, you know, people within the department started to, to whisper saying, you know, we actually think there's no evidence pointing to a gunman here. Uh, we actually think that he might have done this to himself to make it look like a murder. And that's a that's a hell of a thing to say. You know, the, the I was, I'll just say that was certainly my first impression um, from basically six hours after it happened. Well, so, I mean, that's a big thing. And that, that's a, that's a, when you think about it, that's a crazy thing to try to pull off. I mean, you're out with your partner. It's, it, you know, it's, it's dusk. It's not dark outside. You know, there's potentially people around. That's a, that's a kind of a crazy thing to contemplate someone thinking they can pull off. And, and so the officers who, who I think, you know, uh, you know, command down to investigative level who brought that forward were kind of, I think they were thinking they were saving the community from a manhunt that might lead to someone getting falsely arrested. And instead it became, this is a cover up. This is a, this is, you know, this is, Oh, Oh, come on. You're telling us he killed himself. And so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing where like what, what appeared to be uh, what, what could have potentially been a cover up, which is pursuing somebody who, who was actually not, not a shooter uh, morphed into something else. And we're all left sort of like wondering, well, what, what's the real story? And I don't know that we'll ever, you know, one thing I learned from reporting this book is that, you know, 10 years can go by before the truth comes out. So this was my best attempt at parsing through the available evidence, getting some people to talk about things that haven't really been talked about and putting more information out there. And ultimately, I think you'll find that I don't make a conclusion. Um, I think I think I lean a, a certain way, but I don't I make a conclusion because it, it's still it's still pretty controversial and there's still a lot of stuff that could and, and look, there, you and know. I have our opinions, but we don't know. <laughs> we weren't there. No, you know, yeah. really, it's not clear who knows. So, yeah, we can, you put, I think you do a good job on putting the evidence out there and putting both, I mean, yeah, presenting both sides. And, but, but anyone who wasn't there will never know for sure, uh, probably. Mm -hmm. And that's that, that'll be the re, you know, that's how it's going to come down. I mean, it is, yeah, Sean Suter, uh, and I did not, I don't know. I didn't know him personally, he, but by all accounts, he was a, a well, well-loved police officer and, and human being. And I think that's also, um, you know, adds to the the tragedy of the situation. Um, and mm -hmm. certainly, no matter what happened, it's you know, certainly tragic. Um, let me. Is the process in writing this book? How does that uh, differ from writing stories for the Sun? No, oh, I mean. <laughs> You know, writing stories for the sun, especially in this topic, I, you know, we don't always get to write long. When you write long, it's, it's something you really got to pitch and you got to work it out and, and make, you know, they don't just take like lengthy multi-part stories. Although I did do a three-part series on this story that was sort of a precursor to the book, but, but you do have to that, like 6,000 or something. Yeah, it might've been 10 even, but it's still okay. not, you know, pales in comparison. The book I think ended up being 200,000, 180,000. Um, so, you know, with every story, you, you have to have a hook. You have to have a reason for writing it. You can't say, I found more information. I want to write a story. It's got to be, well, why are we doing it? Why is this timely? Why is this necessary? Otherwise, you're folding stuff into other stories. And, and so it's like I really got to, A, contextualize everything, as I, as I explained before. I mean, I got to talk about Marilyn Mosby's election, and I got to talk about zero tolerance, and I got to talk about how all these things, you know, I got to intersect different dates. You know, it was fascinating to me to put a, one of the first things I did was to make a timeline. I wanted to know on the day they robbed this guy, what else was going on in the city? Why, why might no one have been paying attention to that? It was fascinating to look at what, you know, the intersections one day, you know, there was a big verdict in the, one of the Freddie Gray uh, officers trials and all eyes are on the courthouse in downtown and Freddie Gray's all over the front page. And it's like, they're off doing whatever because no one's paying attention. Um, the day, the civil rights investigation came out saying that officers disproportionately stopped black people and abused traffic stops. The GTTF hit the streets, jacking people up, <laughs> it's pulling people over for seatbelt violations on gas station parking lots. I mean, you know, like the, 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 the disconnect between sort of what the people at the top and the official officials, you know, want to see happen and are saying is happening and actually how it plays out on the streets 
you know, eight, nine rungs down from them. That was, that was just an amazing thing. And, and, and I got to bear down on certain things that I think had I been continuing to do daily journalism and I am a daily, I'm not an investigative reporter who gets to take a year at a time to work on something. I'm in the trenches reporting every day. I got to bear down for, for a little bit of time and say, you know, I, this, I really need to get this piece of information. This is extremely important to me. I will not relent on you until I get this. Whereas let's be honest, in daily journalism, sometimes, you know, you, you've done that story and you got to move on. So um, it was a, I really enjoyed the process. I never thought, I never saw myself writing a book. It was not a, a, an ultimate goal of mine, but I, I enjoyed being able to tell this story in a more com complete way. And uh, yeah. I always say, I enjoy having written. I wish I enjoyed the process of writing more. I'd probably be a more prolific writer um, if I actually enjoyed it. Um, I find it's, it's hard, it's hard work. Um, it's it's painful to me to a certain extent, but anyway, I think I I do it because it's partly my job, and I like to think I'm half decent at it. Um, but I don't think it's fun um, for outsiders. And I I'm reading between the lines of what you from what you just said. What of course every city is unique. We all know that, but the cities also have a lot in common in America. Um, what don't people get about Baltimore who haven't who don't live there who haven't lived there who haven't been there um and i mean you know i mean I, I of course always say crab cakes but no not crab cakes but in terms of the structure in terms of of the politics um yeah i mean it's a, that's a tough question i mean my my first thing that comes to mind is sort of you know the battle with crime has just been such an important thing for um mayors and police commissioners and and, and le legislators and 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 oftentimes um, you know, I think there are, I'll be careful how I say this because it's, 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 it's complicated. I think there are good, there are bad things happening with good intentions. <laughs> I think that, you know, these efforts to get guns and to get, you know, pursue drug dealers are rooted in this idea that people are asking them to get the crime rate down. And yet, I, I, you know, I think that that manifests itself in ways that the community doesn't like and doesn't endorse. And yet it's there when something's going on, you call 911. You know, I, I think that, you know, I feel like you've talked about this, but like corner clearing and stuff like that, like the, the officers get a call to 911 from someone on that block saying, get these guys off my corner. I don't like what's going on there. And then the officer rolls up and it's like, you know, why, why are the police hassling us? And it, there's this there's this complicated relationship between the community and the, and the police. Um, and uh, I think we're like we're it's not that's not a new thought. I, you know, that, this has been going on for decades. But I feel like we are thinking about it differently or starting to or, or wrestling with, you know, what does proactive policing mean? How can it coexist without harassment? Um, and so so Baltimore's, you know, that's I try to intersperse that throughout the book that like, you know, they're doing zero tolerance while witnesses are getting killed and a home is getting firebombed that kills an entire family and five children you know that, post, there's by the way i'd quit a couple months before that but i probably would have handled that call that i still been there oh wow okay yeah i mean i mean that you know there's this you know they're doing these things trying to get down crime and, and they and, and then there's this constant turnover again when you can't get crime down you get you get booted you get run out of town and then someone else comes over and they don't know what they're doing and they're trying to learn the city and, and, and it's, it's one crisis to the next, honestly, that, you know, there's, there's some, there's such a lack of reflection because there's always something else going on. So they'll do studies and reports and, and then, you know, six months from now, the whole command staff is turned over. It's not the same people who commissioned that report or who even read that report. Um, I, I, I just think it's a tough, uh, it's a, it's a tough environment. It, a lot of it comes down to leadership, but that, kind of avoids the issue of what about it but yeah lead, bad leadership has consequences and i think baltimore is more than its fair share of bad leadership to be honest and i i did get the sense when i lived there it was the city it's crisis to crisis something this week and then you know tomorrow a water main breaks and then you know a train derails and it's just it, it's sort of every city isn't like that um <laughs> quite yeah. frankly uh but um so to give up sort of a bit of a, which is now historical background, but so uh, arrests uh, maxed out at above 100,000 a year in, um, I believe, 2003. Uh, that's off the top of my head. Somewhere around there, yeah. Um, I think it was 114,000, but I could be wrong. 
Um, after 2003, uh, arrests declined consistently pretty much every year. Um, murder declined. Um, use of force, I believe, police use of force declined. Um, and murders went from, you know, above 300 to under 200. Um, everything was getting better was my sense. Not that it was perfect, not that there weren't flaws, but for literally 15 years, um, everything was trending in the right direction. And the population of Baltimore actually briefly increased for the first time in 50 years. Um, and I remember going there in 2014 and saying, you know, for the first time since I've ever been to this city, um, it looks better. Um, partly because of immigrants had moved into my old neighborhood of Highland Town and Greek Town, um, and crime was down, and you know, Romer Seltzer building or artists living in it, um, and you know, and fewer people were being shot. And I felt that that progress was willfully denied, um, and I don't quite understand why. But this idea of blaming Marty O'Malley uh, for encouraging an arrest-based zero tolerance philosophy when I was there for something that happens 15 years later, um, I just thought was disingenuous at best. Um, things got worse, significantly worse um, after Freddie Gray. Um, in some ways, Baltimore was, I think, saw the increase in crime that the rest of the country just saw last year, but there was a deep police, right. um, partly by design and partly by low morale. Uh, and drug corners were no longer cleared, um, partly because of the DOJ input. Um, and I will say uh, till my dying day, they can be cleared legally and constitutionally, and they must be for the sake of the residents that live there, but that's not happening anymore. Um, the fact that the DOJ came in, it was a pretty shoddy report. It made some very good points about how the department was dysfunctional at times, but there were just some basic, I don't, you know, the, their methodology wasn't clear. It wasn't clear who wrote it. Um, and the largest corruption scandal in Baltimore history was brewing under their nose and they were clueless because I just think they were clueless. It doesn't surprise me they didn't know, but I think it's revealing that you have a consent decree that I still don't know what it's accomplished. Um, and that's it's, it's only really now starting to be implemented. I mean, you know, it's been in place for, for four years and yet they say they're only and now they've been rewriting the policies. They've been studying things and they're only now starting to implement the training. So I think we're at a turning point now. But yeah, it's been it's been six years to get to this point. Um, yeah, we'll see in two years from now, like whether it's a turning point. I hope so. There, there might be. But I mean, murders are higher than they ever are. And the population is declining again, in large part because of crime. People don't, for good reason, don't want to live in neighborhoods where gunshots are a daily occurrence. And you got Foxtrot, the helicopter buzzing above you. Um, there, there are lots of issues going on. Um, so here, one thing, corruption, not just in Baltimore, but when there are large scandals in policing and Rampart in LA comes, always jumps to mind. Yeah. They always have certain things in common, which is highly decorated officers um, with a lot of arrests and gun arrests. There's always drugs involved, sometimes some prostitution thrown in for good measure. Um, they're always a specialized plain clothed unit and they're always geographically um, separated, segregated from the rest of the department. Um, that doesn't, I'm sure there are units where you have, get all that that aren't corrupt um, and I just don't hear about them, but every time there's a big corruption scandal, you always have those similarities. Um, to me, if I had ever risen above the rank of rookie patrol officer on the midnight shift, um, I would say, this is where supervision and leadership comes in. I guess to put it in a question is who do you blame for this? Let, let's say we're going to blame the individual officers. Um, no, I, and parts of the book made me angry when the, the idea that everyone's doing it. No, that's just not true. Um, you and all your criminal friends were doing it. That's not everybody, but right. a lot of, but, but still, um, you know, half dozen plus bad cops set the police department back. I don't know who will years at least. Um, how do you, at some point, leadership should have stopped this? And you talk about some of those leaders. Um, and, you know, I should also mention, you know, I mean, one of the guys who's in prison, I went to the police academy with many of the names of the book I know from my, from my time there. Um, so some of these people I, I, I know personally. Um, how can you prevent this? How, how could have it been prevented? And also, let me throw in another side question. Do you think the police department is doing anything to prevent this from happening again? 
<laughs> you covered a lot of ground in that that wind up. Let me let me try to take it one, one by one. I mean, first of all, you know, I think it's not O'Malley's fault. Uh, I mean, I think that the zero tolerance was a, you know, it's not surprising that he tried to import New York police commanders, New York policing styles to try to duplicate the New York crime declines. It just wasn't um, the New York turnaround is there's much more going on there than just, you know, higher numbers of arrests. And I feel like here it, that that's how it was implemented. And so they went from locking people up to put a chill in the community that if you better, you know, better keep yourself, you know, you better not do anything wrong because we're going to lock you up for anything. So then the Bielfeld years was sort of like, well, let's try to be more precise. Let's try to highlight geographic zones better. Let's try to highlight individuals better. And let's try to be more precise. And they had a working relationship with the prosecutor's office where they were in lockstep with each other. And I think now, I, I think that that client, all of that, throughout that time period, there was aggressive policing encouraged um, in good ways. I, you know, I do, do I think that Anthony Barksdale, the deputy during that time, you know, wanting people to go out and do certain things like absolutely not. You know, he, he's such a great person to talk to because he understands he, he's able to talk about the reasons why police do the things they do and the things you want them to do and the goals during that period, even if maybe on the lower levels, it didn't get carried out the way he wanted to or things were being kept from them. Um, and that's a pretty favorable take on him. I think there are some people who say that he did encourage um, a, a lo loose uh, climate in terms of this kind of stuff. But to hear him talk about it is pretty inspiring, I would say. Um, but I think, you know, you see Jenkins moving from making 300 arrests a year during zero tolerance. I mean, he personally, you can look it up, you know, he, he personally made uh, a ton of arrests during zero tolerance. And then you see him moving into the violent crimes impact section, which is the main tool during the the Be Bielefeld Barksdale years. Interrupt you for one second, um, just so people yep. know, because people tend to assume cops make more arrests than they actually do. Where um, a cop who's on the street, you know, make between you know probably ten and twenty arrests in a year. I mean, assist in many more, um, but it's not. Um, cops generally don't arrest somebody every day. So the yeah, fact I, that they made three hundred arrests is mind blowing. That's just the ones that ended up in case search. That's not the ones that were being rejected at central booking. Um, so, yeah. And then you see him in these aggressive plain clothes units and they're doing aggressive work. I mean, they're going after big players and there's all sorts of allegations that, that are coming forward at that time about them sort of, you know, doing a search without a warrant. It's, they call them like sneaking peeks, do, you know, finding something and moving it or, or you know, um, misrepresenting how things went down in order to get into places. And, and, and it's always... You know, the defense, there was a, a remarkable instances where defendants in like a federal court would say, would stand up and say, or take the stand and say, I did what I did have drugs, but they're not telling the truth about how that happened. That, that kind of stuff's remarkable to me. I mean, I don't, I don't see stuff like that play out uh, very often. And that's, that was happening during this time. And yet people were saying, Get, yeah, give me a break, man. You know, you know, who, you know, who's going to believe you? There's a remarkable line where a judge says, well, if I believe you, then I'd have to believe all these officers are lying. And it's like officers who are in jail now <laughs> for lying. So so in terms of accountability, I mean, I think that I think ev I, I like to blame everybody. <laughs> I mean, there's some defense attorneys who will tell you we knew all about this. And, and, and yet, you know, no, people weren't saying it to me. Um, they had their own reasons for protecting their clients interests. They would say, you know that's not worth it. We shouldn't bring that up. No one's going to believe you. It, you know, let's try this other angle. Why don't you just take a plea? You know, and that there's reasons for that. Um, there's prosecutors who want to win a case and they're brushing off concerns when they do come forward from defense attorneys. They're saying, give me a break. Um, they trust the officers. They, they, they believe them. They've worked with them over the years. They've seen them. You know, Jenkins, one prosecutor told me that Jenkins would call in the middle of the night asking about how to go about something the right way. And so why would she ever think that he's not doing things the right way? Then you've got to th talk about this, the supervisors, you know. Um, Jenkins became a supervisor, and that's difficult. He's supposed to be the one providing that check on his officers. He's the one on the ground with them. He's the one 
in the houses with them. He's driving around with them. And then he reports back to the lieutenant who's got, you know, three other sergeants in her squad and, and, and checking in with them, ex- expecting them to give reliable information. It really does emphasize the importance of sergeants. Um, you know, the white shirts, the commanders, they get all the, you know, they're in all the meetings and the briefings and they're the ones who get, you know, but, but it's those people, it's those frontline sergeants. They have such a crucial role. And in this case, we had three sergeants who are in prison now um, for, for doing things. And so it's like, you know, um, it, there's, the, there's a lot of blame to go around. Um, judges, you know, I could go on and on, but, you know. On a more personal level, on reporting, on doing your job, um, how do you deal with the trauma of what you see? Um. You know, I, I often say that um, I don't experience it in the same way that the officers and, the, and the, the people in the community do. I mean, I show up after the fact a lot of the time um, and, you know, now having to cycle through all this kind of to the subject matter and talk to people experiencing it every day is certainly a challenge. Um, but, you know, we we have a different role to play. Um, you know, certainly I was embedded with the homicide unit in 2015. And, I, you know, that's one of the first times I think I've is the first time I think I ever sort of stood over a dead body, um, multiple dead bodies. And, and that was, uh, uh, I, you know, I can't, I, it's amazing to me that people do that for a living every day, or, you know, just even the medical examiners and, and people in the healthcare field. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's something, but, um, but, you know, I, 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 I always say that I'm motivated. I, I'm, I'm surprised I'm not burned out yet. <laughs> um, and the reason I don't think I'm burned out is because every day there's this new story that has to be told. And I don't, this is not like a, you know, it sounds sappy, I guess, but you know, th- you know, every day it's like, Oh gosh, if we don't tell the story, it's not going to get told. Let's, let's, let, let's get to work. And that's the way we approach it. And you don't have enough time to really reflect on it. I remember in 2015 feeling very emotionally drained, just having seen everything that was going on in the city, that crime spike um, that occurred was, was really, shocking you know just like you said we were below 200 homicides um and and even though it didn't we didn't get there again we weren't we weren't far and it was like oh my god oh my gosh like it went it went up overnight to like 80 like percent higher and it's still there it's been there every year and and yes like you said every other city is now experiencing that too and you look at what's happening in like philadelphia and other places i mean it's it's staggering um and it's hard not to make some of the connections you're making about you know the way you know, things, things have shifted and, and, and what we see. And yet I think people are, are right in a lot of ways to, to, to say that we want to, we want a different kind of policing. And I wonder if that means this is our new normal. Um, you know, if, if, if people do want officers to back off and have a different role and that presently is leading to the crime spike we're seeing, is, is this the way it is? And that, that's a, that's a troubling question, but uh, I know that's something that you think about a lot. Add another twist to that I think is particularly troubling because I think a lot of the voices are coming from outside the community and if you live in a high crime community um, and want less policing we should listen to that voice I don't live there Um, but I hear a lot of outsiders in the name of of racial justice a lot of white outsiders saying that um, black neighborhoods need less policing and that's um, an interesting point I I remember there was I was waiting for this there was a Gallup poll that came out months ago that found that um Black Americans did not want to defund or lower police funding by a margin of like 70 percent. And I was like, you know, there's a there's there's folks who we're not hearing from in this conversation. And I I think our current leadership gets that. I I think the mayor of Baltimore right now is from the community. His family's in the community, grew up in the community. And I don't think he I think he's trying to thread that needle. I think he wants to reduce it where it where it can be reduced or where it can be made better. And I but I do not think he is in a abolish or defund the police guy i just don't see that coming from him i, I do think he's going to try to make some inroads on it though in a way that's hopefully positive well yeah the, yeah, the polling data you referred to polling has consistently shown that black americans want more policing more than white americans do um and i'm sure just because black Americans are more likely to live in neighborhoods where crime is a greater issue. Now, more policing and better policing are not mutually exclusive. Um, and it doesn't right. mean you like the police to say you want more of them. Um, and it's, you know, the onus is on the police department to provide better policing. But this idea that we're going to get better policing with less money is, to me, absurd. But in some ways, I think Baltimore has an advantage in having a black political uh, power base and, you know, being a, a black majority city. 
it avoids some of these debates that Seattle's and Portland and Minneapolis and New York are having. Um, and I, and I think just to just to build on that one one reason why though I mean I mean uh, some might say that the reason they support police by that much is again because there's not a, a, a there hasn't been another apparatus like the like the alternative isn't hasn't been like uh, presented or 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 formed and so it's like well if you're presented with the option of taking the police out of my neighborhood where there's shootings like of course not but but perhaps maybe if that was like presented in tandem with another you know alternative but you know i'd be curious to see but the if results were, but if this were an academic experiment it would not get improved by the by the human subjects committee um i am all for alternatives but the idea that they have that they're balanced against policing to me is absurd um we will know immediately when demand for police goes down because people will stop calling for police um, let us get there um it doesn't have to come from the police department budget, which is tends to be less than a lot of people think. It's um, it's usually three to six percent of state and local funding goes to law enforcement. That leaves ninety five percent of the budget or higher taxes. Um, we don't need to defund police to set up alternative structures because I'm skeptical of those structures. I'm not saying they couldn't work, but I want them to work before we start getting rid of police, and that's I think sort of the missing step. Baltimore also, um, in my mind. Uh, positively isn't kind of immune from the defund movement because the judge who's running the consent decree simply said sorry but um no, no you can't defund it's not allowed i mean isn't that isn't that amazing i mean honestly there's this there's this conversation and this push and yet our reform efforts that were already undertaken before that kind of went mainstream quote unquote you know was saying like no like you, you're locked into a, a a process here where you will be spending more money on police you know you need more technology more training more officers you know, if your community policing plan involves officers spending, I don't know, 40 percent of their time interacting with members of the community in a positive way, you're going to need more officers so that people can respond to calls while these other guys are guys and girls are, are talking to people and just making you know, have, 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 making connections in the community. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a, a, a really amazing sort of confluence of events. Um, are you familiar with um, Alex uh, Kotlowitz's book? Um What's the title? An American Summer, Love and Death in Chicago. I'm familiar with the author, but not, uh, I have not He's read He's a great it. author. Um, but he talks very much about the, the trauma of violence, um, both at a personal level from writing the book, but also um, just simply the victims of violence. I think often that is not the idea that, you know, it's so easy to read about a shooting in the paper or often not read about a shooting in the paper um, and not understand how that the trauma of that the, to the victim, to the loved ones, to the family, it's 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 it's, it's just decimating to to life around that 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 and and I, I mean it's part of the reason I care about these matters is because I've seen some of that trauma, um, and my God is it brutal? Um, and of course, yeah, the 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 police officers, the 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 EMS people, the doctors and nurses that have to deal with too. It's some you know it's it, some people deal with it better than others, and I actually. Personally, I don't think I had a problem with seeing death and gore, uh, but it's a heavy ask to say this is part of your, you know, yeah, we, you know, we are asking it and we have to hold everyone accountable for, for their behavior, but it's a heavy ask to say, okay, this, you're going to see a lot of people dead and dying. Um, you're going to, you know, hear gunshots, a few, occasionally they might be at you. Um, and also, um, you know, treat everyone with respect uh, all the time. Um and also, you know, get people into cuffs who don't want to be put into cuffs. Um, those are all tough ass, but that 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 is sort of separate um, from what you're writing about um, uh, in in your book. And we own this city. I want to get the title out there as much as possible. Um, the so it's been turned in. It is being turned into. Um, a TV show, and not just any TV show, uh, but a TV show by the um, famous David Simon, who wrote Homicide Life on the Street, um, was a Baltimore Sun reporter and is perhaps most famous, um, f at least in Baltimore, uh, for The Wire, though he's had a bunch of series since then. Um, how did that come about? You just got the magic connection? You're like, this is going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, I, Simon is someone I've known over the years. Um, and uh, I mean, he remains interested in the things going on in the Baltimore Police Department. He's written 
you know, blog posts about, you know, the way they changed the way homicides were charged, you know, requiring prosecutorial sign off on it. Um, so we've been in touch. And during the trial, you know, um, you know, again, there's this extraordinary couple of years where we, we had the Freddie Gray case. We had the unrest. We had the charges. We had the reform. We had the GCTF. We had Suter's death. And he, uh, you know, he, he said, like, I, I want to make a show out of this. HBO wants to make a show out of this. And you ought to write a book. And, you know, I wasn't contemplating that in that moment. I, I was covering the trial. I was I'm filing daily stories. And it it seemed like, so the you book know, idea came from in part from him. I didn't know. That. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that's it's been in the works since then, really. Um, and it's just now, uh, you know, uh, kind of broken through that it's actually happening. But uh, yeah, so it's been a great I'm in the writer's room. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a consultant um, and I help them to, you know, I, they're looking for real life things that happen that can be scenes that help tell the story. It's going to be a six part mini series. And, uh, you know, I, I help with um, keeping it true to life and uh, pursuing things that maybe I didn't have in my book that they're interested in, in building out a scene. And so, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, not, not only Simon, but uh, Ed Burns who worked on the corner and the, and the wire and uh, George Pelicanos and he sort of got that team back together. So it's, a, it's an incredible thing to be a part of. It's their sort of, I guess it's their, if there's an HBO trilogy of Baltimore shows, this is the, the third in the trilogy. I've never met Ed Burns. Um, I do know uh, George Pelicanos, not well, but I've met him. And uh, also, I'm a big fan of his uh, fiction. Um, he writes he writes crime novels in Washington, D.C. And um, he's written a bunch of them. Um, and of course, he's a fellow Greek American. So I always <laughs> like him for that. Um, I will give you one um, bit of advice, Justin, perhaps in closing, but one of the never do a book signing next to david simon i did one once in, and it was in sydney australia and it was perhaps the most depressing wow. hour of my life as the crowd lined up around the sydney opera house for david simon and i signed i believe zero copies of zero book. you didn't even get a little uh little extra no maybe there okay. was one or two anyway, overflow <laughs> it was at least i got to talk to david simon during that and he was he was very kind to me um, yeah, the, the the pandemic has uh, any any traveling I might have been able to do for book promo has uh, sadly been restricted to what you're seeing right now. I'm happy to be here. I, I'd like to be there in person and in other places, but this is my uh, what 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 can you do? It's a it's a global pandemic. Yeah. Thanks very much. This is Peter Moskos. This is Quality Policing. I'm here with Justin Fenton, who um, has recently, well, he wrote and has recently been released. And it is We Own This City, a true story of crime, cops, and corruption in an American city. And that American city is none other than the American city of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And um, keep up the good work. Okay. Nice talking to you.